Now let's start with a very important topic that is Coulomb's law. In 1785, there is a famous scientist named Coulomb. He discovered that there is some relationship between the force exerted on the charges. So he produced several results on it. Based on that result, the law which came into existence is called Coulomb's law. Now let's study this law in detail. What happened in this case, we are going to take two charges. The charges are Q1 and Q2. So in this case now, Let's draw two charges. This is charge 1 that is Q1. This is charge 2 that is Q2. Now, we all know that electric charges have two different properties. The first property is that the like charges ripple each other and the unlike charges attract each other. So, we are going to take the first case. That is, they both are of same polarity. Okay, the Q1 is also positive polarity and Q2 is also a positive polarity. If they both are positive, so what happened? That repulsion between them occurs. Okay, now let's see from here. There is some force between Q1 and Q2. Now, if repulsion occurs, then Q1 will move this side and Q2 will move this side. That is Q1 and Q2 both moves on the other side. That is, if I will draw a force, this force is drawing Q1 at this side and this force is drawing Q2 on this side. Okay, now we will see that the force which is exerted on Q1, let's say F1, this is the force which is exerted by the Q2. Confused? Yeah, listen here. If suppose this is my hand, okay, and this hand is pushing this hand. So, what happened that this particular hand is experiencing a force by this hand. When this hand is exerting pressure, then my this hand is moving. So, how Q1 is moving? Q1 is moving because Q2 is exerting a pressure in the direction of F1. Okay, so it is also called F12. F12 means the force exerted on Q1 by charge Q2. Likewise, on this side also, Q2 is moving apart, that is the force is F2, but this movement of apart is basically done by Q1, that is Q1 is pushing Q2 on this side. So, the force now become F21, that is the force on Q2 by Q1. Now, if I change the charge, okay, let's say this is Q1 and this is Q2, so same the charges, some force must be there. Okay. Now, if I make Q1 as positive and Q2 as negative. So, now what happened? That there must be a force of attraction. This force of attraction, basically, what it is doing? It is pulling Q1 to the side of Q2 and it is pulling Q2 to the side of Q1. Both are coming close together because they are attracted towards each other. Now, Q1 is pulling Q2, that is it is represented by force F1. Q2 is coming near, so the force is represented as F2. Now, how Q1 is coming near? Q1 is coming near because Q2 is drawing Q1 near to it. That is, this force can be represented as F12. That is the force exerted on Q1 by Q2. Same likewise, this is the force F2 which is exerted on Q2 but how it is exerting? It is exerted by the Q1. So, we can write it as F21. Now, these are the forces which are dependent on some parameters. Now, force is directly proportional to distance. How it is proportional? The distance is the separation between the two charges. That is, this is the distance I am talking about. This is the distance I am talking about and this distance is represented by small r. How it is represented as small r? In both the cases, q1 and q2 are coming near to each other. Then what happened? Then the force increases. That is, if they are moving apart and I reduce the distance between the two, I make q1 and q2 near, then what happened? The force of repulsion increases. 
Likewise, if they are coming near to it, that is, if the distance decreases, then in that condition also the force of attraction increases. So, this means that the force is inversely proportional to distance. If distance decreases, so force increases. Now, the Coulomb have stated that force is inversely proportional to 1 upon r square. That is, if the distance of separation between the two charges increases, how much it increases? Square times. Then in that condition, the force reduces. So, this is the relationship between the force and the distance of separation between the two charges. One thing that you might have noticed that the distance which I am talking about is the straight line distance. Okay, I am not talking about any curved line or any zigzag line. No, I am just telling you the straight line between Q1 and Q2. So, one thing that you have to note in the Coulomb's law that the distance of separation between Q1 and Q2 should be the straight line joining the two. The second point between that is force is somewhat related to Q1 and Q2. Now, what it is? This is Q1 and this is Q2. If Q1 and Q2 change their polarity, that is one become positive, the other become negative. Or if both become positive, if both become negative, then what happened? There is some influence on the force as well. That means the Coulomb have stated that force is also dependent upon the charges. So this is what the force is dependent on Q1 and Q2. So based on these parameters, the Coulomb have formulated a law. Thus the law states that the Coulomb force, which is represented by capital F, is equals to the product of charges that is Q1 and Q2 upon the distance between the two charges which is represented by R. So it is R square. Now this term is related to force by means of a constant. So the constant is represented by K. Now let's first see what is this constant K. First let's put it inside the bracket because this is a very important law. Okay now let's move on to the constant. The K is called the Coulomb's constant. So this Coulomb's constant plays a very important role. It has a very specific value. The specific value of K is 9 into 10 raised to the power 9. This is the value allotted to the constant which is K. Now you say that how this value comes from. There is also a proper concept behind it. But first let's see what is the unit of this K. Now, how to find out the unit? For that, you have to again go into the Coulomb's law. Now, the force is represented by which unit? Newton. The charges are represented by which unit? Coulomb. There are two charges. So, it becomes Coulomb square. Now, in this condition, the distance is represented by meter. So, it is a square. So, this becomes meter square. Now, what should be the unit of K? The unit of K now becomes Newton meter square per Coulomb square. So, from this formula, you can easily find out the unit of K, which becomes Newton meter square per Coulomb square. Now, let us see that how this value comes from. It plays a very important role. This value comes from a very specific formula and the formula behind it that the K is equals to 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught. So, this is the formula for the Coulomb's constant. Now, see. 4 is a constant. Pi. Pi also is a constant which has a specific value. What is the value of pi? The pi is represented as 3.14. Now comes to epsilon naught. Epsilon naught, what do you mean by epsilon naught? Epsilon naught basically means absolute permittivity in free space. Now, this free space is a very important term. Free space resemble to vacuum. Okay. Now, if we talk of free space or vacuum, then that means we are talking of some specific value which is taken as a reference value. So, this epsilon naught is basically a reference value that is in free space and this value is 8.85. So, the unit for epsilon naught is farad per meter. 
Now you can see that on putting the values that is 1 upon 4 multiplied by 3.14 multiplied the value of epsilon naught. What you will get? You will get 9 into 10 is to the power 9. So from here the value of the Coulomb's constant came. Now if we take the absolute permittivity in free space then in that condition the force that is the Coulomb's force is also found for free space or for vacuum. So, in this condition, the formula would be 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught, which is the value of a constant and the same value that is Q1, Q2 upon R square. Now, the question arises that is the force always found in vacuum? No, the force is found on different medium. So, when the force is found on different medium, then what happens? Let's see. Now, in this case, when the force is found in another medium, apart from vacuum or free space, then in that condition, the epsilon naught changes. Okay. Now, what is the value of epsilon naught? See here. The total epsilon, this is called the absolute permittivity in medium, which is represented by a single epsilon. Sometimes it is also represented as epsilon t. So, this is called the absolute permittivity in medium. Now, the formula for it is epsilon naught into epsilon r. What is epsilon naught? I have already told you that the absolute permittivity in free space or in vacuum Epsilon r is basically a relative permittivity. What is this relative permittivity? Relative permittivity is basically used to give the relationship between the vacuum and the medium. That's why the term relative is there. Relative means in comparison to it. So, the formula modifies as 1 by 4 pi. Instead of epsilon naught, now I have to pay, put the value epsilon. And the formula would be Q1, Q2 upon R square. Okay. Now elaborate it. If I am going to elaborate it, then it becomes 1 by 4 pi. What is the value of epsilon? Epsilon naught into epsilon R. So put the value here. This would become Q1, Q2 upon R square. So the force of any medium. Now the new law of Coulomb is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught into epsilon R. Q1, Q2 upon R square. This Coulomb force is basically a vector quantity. What is a vector quantity? A vector quantity is a quantity which has a magnitude as well as a direction. So it is basically a physical quantity. When we have to find the magnitude and direction, so in that condition the law is somewhat modified. Now if we have to find the magnitude and direction, so let's see what the notation for it. In the case when we have to find the magnitude of the force, the magnitude of force means that is the numerical value of the force. In that condition, the formula becomes 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught Q1 Q2 upon R square. You will say the formula is the same. What is the difference? Yes, the difference is basically in the value this. We have to put a modulus sign here. What this modulus sign mean? This modulus sign represents the non-negative value. Okay, the non-negative value means that if Q1 and Q2 turns to be negative, in that condition also your output should be positive only. So, we are taking not the direction, we are taking only the magnitude. If suppose I am telling you that I have to move 30 km to the east. Okay, in that condition 30 km is the magnitude and east is the direction. So, 30 km represents the numerical value. In this case also I am asking about the magnitude of the force that is the numerical value of the force. If I have to find the force in magnitude as well as in direction. So, when the direction is concerned in that condition what will be my formula? It would become 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught. Q1, Q2 upon R square. You have to remove the modulus sign. So, when the force gives you magnitude as well as direction, in that condition, it is a vector quantity. A vector quantity is always represented by an arrow on the particular symbol. So, the Coulomb's law is basically the force which is a vector quantity is equals to the constant which is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught into Q1, Q2 which is the product of the two charges. It can be like charges, it can be unlike charges divided by the square of the separation between them and that too it is along the straight line. 
So this is all about the Coulomb's law. Now some important points that we can conclude from this law is, the first important point is that the Coulomb's law is always taken along a straight line. That is, R should be along a straight line joining. This is what I am continuously emphasizing you. Why? Because it is a very important thing for you to consider. Second, the charges which I am talking about, Q1 and Q2, they can be like and they can be unlike. They can be both positive, they can be both negative. No matters what. Whatever will be the charges, you will get the answer of force. Okay. Force can be negative, force can be positive. Now, if Q1 and Q2 both are positive, then force would become what? Positive, obviously. Okay, so that is the repulsive force. If two Q1 and Q2 are negative, then negative, negative gives you positive. Again, the force is positive. That is, if Q1 and Q2 are like charges, then force always comes to be positive. Second is the case when the charges on Q1 and Q2 differ. That is, Q1 and Q2 have unlike charges in that condition now. If I give Q1 as positive and Q2 is negative, now you multiply the two, you will get negative answer. So, no matter Q1 is negative or Q2 is negative, the force is always negative in this case. Why? Because this is the force of attraction. So, force of repulsion is positive, force of attraction is negative. So, this is the Coulomb's law important points that you have to consider. The third important point is that the charges should be point charges. I am not considering about the dimensions of Q1 and Q2. I am just saying a point charge that is Q1 and Q2. So you have to keep in mind that this law is applicable only for point charges. Fourth point. Fourth point states that the Coulomb law which I am talking about gives you the Coulomb force is a vector quantity. It gives you magnitude also. It gives you direction also. I've already explained this term, so we don't need to go it back. So these are the some of the important points that you have to consider after studying the Coulomb's law.